song coming up, and uh, one of the lines that I've been going over and over in my head is perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior and happy and blessed. So um, submission, submitting to the Lord, it's not a bad thing. It's not. You know, we have our things that we want to do, ideas that we think are going to be the greatest way and get it done and we're going to succeed, but God knows. God knows what is best for us, and uh, sometimes we don't always submit, and so we're going to let those go. We're going to leave it alone. We're going to say, God, sorry, I messed up. I didn't submit, but I want you guys to just focus on him, submit to him this morning, and freely rest and worship in him, okay? All right. Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation. I've been purchased of God. my 
Cause he's the name of us. 
sing with me how great. Come on, church. Is our God. And oh, see how great. Sing it to him. How great is our God. Oh, how great is our God. Oh, sing with me. How great is our God. And oh, see how great. Take a couple seconds and just praise him. Praise him with your mouth. Just praise him. Praise him. Thank you. Come on. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. this morning. Hallelujah. God, you are so good to us. You are so good. Better than we deserve. Amen. We're glad to have our guest with us today. We thank God for you. We want you to make yourself at home. Anything we can do to help you, just grab an usher. They will be glad to help you and, and whatever. If you have a need this morning, God is here to meet that need. Amen. That's why we gather in his presence. He is here. We, we know that. We feel his presence. Today is Mission Sunday. Hallelujah. I love Mission Sunday. I love every Sunday. <laughs> but Mission Sunday especially. Because we are tied with some ministries that we pray to give to generously. Amen. God, open up the generosity of our hearts. Open that up. You may not know what that looks like or feels like. Maybe you struggle in that area. But he will help you. He will not ask you for more than you're able to give. 
I promise you that. He will not. He will, he will make a way. But give generously. We, we give and, and support the Peru missions. Uh, Pastor John Lanier is there in the churches. and uh, they, they have plans and visions like we do, church. We ha God has given us visions here. Some of them we seek. Amen? Impact Christian Academy. School of Ministry. Two years ago, that might not have been nothing. It was just a, it was a vision. It was a thought. It was a prayer. But now it's functioning. Praise God. And it's growing. One of our greatest outreaches today is the school. I believe that. The greatest outreach. Outreach is hard. The harvest is out there, but how do we get to where we need to go? Only by his direction, and I believe the school is the greatest outreach we have. So pray, 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 church. Pray for that. So Peru Missions, we, we support uh, we support that ministry there. Uh, has their training up leaders? Has their training up in equipping the saints for the work of the ministry? We can be a part of that by our generosity. And your life will change when you let generosity go out. It will change. It will change your thinking. We also give to uh, Columbia Missions, and I don't think Sister Lena's with us this morning, but uh, pray for her. She kind of heads that up there of, of uh, clothing for children, and, and uh, I pray that we can take a, a mission trip there one day. If it gets organized, we, it has to be organized, but I, I would like that. So pray for that ministry and, and uh, others. There will be other opportunities. God is so good to us. He is so good to us. And we thank him for that. We thank the Lord for his goodness, for his grace and mercy that is, it is new every day. And uh, we just give him praise. Father, we lift you up in this place today for your goodness, for your grace. We thank you for every person that is here with us today. And we pray, Father, for those that are not. Lord, we know we have some, some family some church family that is suffering from sicknesses and illness. And God, we are praying for your peace to be upon them, for healing over their bodies. God, you promise us a home with you one day. If you will come, we will have a place with you. But until then, Lord, we want to serve and work for you, God. But we pray for those that are sick. But God, we pray for these ministries, for Pastor John, uh, Linares this morning and those pastors that are under his care there and the churches and uh, Sister Lena as she heads up that ministry. And I pray here for the church, for the local church. God, you continue to pour out your blessings and your goodness upon us that we can share, that we can share that, that we would not hoard that up, but we will share that, God, in the direction that you give us. And we give you thanks and praise this morning. Amen. <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, us. Hello, I'm Lonnie Berger, the author and president of Every Man a Warrior. Men, if you are involved with an Every Man a Warrior group, then you are part of a movement of God that is happening around the world. Touching more than 50,000 men here in the United States and 12,000 men in Brazil, we have sold more than 225,000 books in 58 countries and 24 languages in the first 11 years since Every Man a Warrior was launched. God has done this. In Europe, 175 groups in 17 different countries have used the curriculum. In Kenya, 650 prisoners in 22 prisons are currently working through the Everyman of Warrior material. And the Supreme Commander of the Kenyan prison system has asked us to come into all 120 prisons. More than 150 of these men have prayed to receive Christ with our staff. This spring, 175 Everyman Warrior leaders who have led more than 
1,000 EMA groups met together in Tennessee to learn deeper skills of becoming an expert builder of men and men's ministries that multiply. In May, this training was given to European leaders representing nine countries when we all met together in Norway and Albania. God is blessing the Every Man a Warrior ministry, and I know it is in part because women have prayed. But Every Man a Warrior does something different. It helps men become the man, the husband, the father, and the spiritual leader that God wants them to be. Exactly what the women have prayed for. If we want to change our culture for Christ, we must reach the men. And if you want to have a successful men's ministry, help men win the battles they fight every day. Every man a warrior does exactly that. Men, movements of God are rare, and I want to encourage you to be involved. Once you have completed the course, start a group of your own and experience the joy of seeing God use your life to impact other men. In almost every group, a marriage gets saved from divorce. Many men report that they learned how to rebuild relationships with their children, and some men get set free from the prison of pornography. When you lead an Every Man a Warrior group, you not only impact the men, but you influence wives and children as well. Help us grow the work of Every Man a Warrior, and I hope you too will come join the movement. Thank you. All right. Well, I don't know if I could say it better than Lonnie did, but I'll just tell you a little bit about um, what came into my heart. So I was standing over there worshiping, and what immediately came to me was the, the conversation that I had with my father-in-law when we were leaving church one day in Hawaii. And, of course, the spiritual leader of our family is my dad. I submit to his authority. And he says, son, he said, uh, sometimes people talk about the first fruits, and they talk about the first fruits being the tithing. But he says, I don't believe that's the case. And I was really puzzled because I've heard all my life that tithing was the first fruits. And so I kind of gave him the one eyebrow raise, embraced myself, because anytime you speak to my father-in-law, you're about to get a 90-point presentation on how it does it, how it works, from Old Testament to New Testament, back to Old Testament, and then everything in between. So dad looks at me and he says, well, let's think about that. He says they gave first fruits was the offering to the Lord because they believed there was going to be a great harvest. So until the harvest was completely grown, then they gave the 10% because now the harvest was completely grown. So he told me, he said, that first fruits is what you believe the harvest is to come. So I said, wow. I shouldn't have been surprised. You know, when my, when my dad talks to me, but you can ask my wife, my, my jaw was in my lap, and I was like, you're so awesome, Dad. You know, that's why they call you Dad, right? So that's how I see this ministry. In 2017, this was presented to us here at the church. We have two ministries going on. We talk about the Every Man a Warrior ministry, but we also have Cultivating Holy Beauties, or as my wife likes to refer to it as, uh, Warrior Princess, right? But we have, both, we have both ministries, and both of these ministries, just raise your hand real quick if this has impacted your life. So if you look around our church right now, even our youth, Christian didn't want to put, he did the halfway. Go ahead and get that thing high in the sky there, all right? So even if it didn't impact you, uh, you didn't sit through the ministry, you saw it working in your husband or your son or, you know, your brother or whatever the case may be because uh, strong men make strong families. When we put the Lord our God the first, uh, then that man comes home and you're actually able to live under the umbrella. I heard a couple of guys I thought was really funny. They were lock, talking to their wives and they said, hey, you, come here, get under the umbrella. <laughs> right? Well, in order for you to say, hey, come here, get under that umbrella, guess what you got to have? You got to have authority from who? Yeah. Right. From God. And we don't get that authority just handed to us on a, on a platter. That authority comes from a daily walk, a daily meditation of quiet times with the Lord. Now I'll tell you, I don't know a better program out there than what Lonnie put together in the Every Man of Warrior team. And I am truly, truly thankful 
for what they did. I'm thankful for a lot of things. I'm thankful when they talk about that praying wife. Well, I think about Kimberly who prayed back in two, 2010. And she, during school of ministry one day, she mentioned that she was praying for the future of this church. And immediately my spirit just told me, tell her, tell her thank you. And I said, thank you, Kimberly. I don't know if you remember that, but I said, thank you, Kimberly, because your prayers saved my family. And then the tools that came into this church that allowed me to pick up my sword. In the Marine Corps, we're given a sword. It represents leadership. Giving my sword, the sword of the spirit, and I learned how to use that sword through constant uh, reminders and constant training through every man a warrior. So I'll tell you right now, as I was talking right in my mouth, if you could just take a couple things off of what I'm saying right now is, one, I'll ask you this, uh, do you believe in the harvest? Yes. If you do believe in the harvest, I want you to sit here and I want you to think, I want you to pray quietly to yourselves about how much to give to this ministry. How much to give? How much is it worth? We talk about the school of ministry, and that's awesome because when the elders and I, when the elders sit down and we talk about the school of ministry, we always get excited about the children, and we always say this. We say, how can you put a price on a soul? How can you put a price on a kid who raises his hand to Miss Sarita and says, what does this mean to give my life to Christ? And then that instructor uh, or that monitor or supervisor or whatever they call them, that that instructor is able to come over there and, and take them by the hand and lead them to Christ. Well, the same is in Every Man a Warrior or Cultivating Holy Beauties. When you start these discipleship programs, you may not be uh, saved. You may not be walking with Christ, but throughout that books that they give you, one, two, three, and there's a fourth book, as you begin to walk through those, you see the transformation start to happen. So I ask you today, as we sit and we pray, and the ushers are coming back through, and they're going to take up another offering for the Every Man a Warrior, I ask you to ask yourself this question. How can you put a price on a man or a woman being saved? If you can put a price on that, come see me. We'll talk. All right? But I don't believe you can. I believe that is just absolutely priceless. That is priceless. And when someone comes to the Lord, it's the happiness like I've never seen in my life. I get the spirit of the office linebacker where I just want to hit somebody because I'm so <laughs> excited. Because once you've ate bologna and you get a steak, guess what you never want to do again? You don't ever want to eat that bologna, right? No matter how much my dad says bologna sandwiches are good, you never want to eat that bologna. So as the ushers come, I'm just going to pray one more time. Father God, we just come before you right now, Lord Jesus, and we just pray, pray right now that you will put a number on our heart in order to uh, continue this partnership with every man a warrior and cultivating holy beauties, Lord Jesus. I just pray right now that you would just bless this ministry and all that they do in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm Richard, and this is my beautiful wife, Jessica. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and we're first uh, church pastors, if you guys don't know. And this is first church uh, sign up month. Uh, so we're here uh, to let you know the importance of first church. Uh, the three things that we go by with first church is uh, breaking bread, which is a meaningful. Uh, fellowship, breaking into the word, getting into God's word, and having an intimate relationship with his word and with him, and then breaking out, breaking out out of the four walls of the church, four walls of your home, but more importantly, the walls that um, your own personal um, uh, walls that you have to get out of your comfort zone, okay? Uh, and in doing that, we're going to go ahead and uh, also, we have things that you can get involved with this uh, coming month throughout Bethesda, and we, I don't know how can we say this, but we encourage you, we want you, we need you to get involved. Uh, this is very important to be part of the family. Uh, the first one is gonna be uh, Impact Christian Academy. Uh, it's taking applications. Um, also, uh, I'm kinda trying to read the, the notes, it's not as big back there. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. 
<laughs> Thank you. Well, there we go. <laughs> but, uh, the exact, uh, Breaking Bread Impact Christian Academy is holding a back to school bash. 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Come out for our concession, yard sale, inflatable, and fellowship. Okay, I'm definitely going to look back because I cannot see that at all. Um, another <laughs> example of uh, breaking into the word is August 20th, Step Up Sunday. Woohoo! Um, join us in congratulating those in our preschool, elementary, and youth as they step up to the next level. Like Pastor Fred was talking about, our youth growing up, I mean, that's breaking into the word because they are being taught by our, our instructors, the scriptures, at whatever age, from, you know, from a small to up to the youth and then from beyond that. And another example of breaking bread and breaking out, August 28th, 5.30 p.m., Feeding America, come out and fellowship and help our community in, process, in the process of 300 Peterson Drive, Elizabethtown. And that's just blessing others since we have been blessed for so much. Um, first church sign-up sheets are in the lobby, so make sure that you come back and sign up. And Richard and I are going to be back there um, to help you with anything that you might need. Um, let's see. I've lost my place. Um, yeah, just come back and see us. <laughs> just during uh, meet and greet, you can just go through the double doors, take a left, and we'll be at the table to assist you. It's not hard to do. It's very simple. You'll still have time to come back and um, do meet and greet. Okay. At this time, we're going to take opportunity to introduce you to uh, a dynamic duo, First Church Pastors. Uh, they've been a blessing to us. They've been one of the first ones that reached out to us when we first came here, and they've been a blessing to us since we've been here. Uh, and that's going to be Ricky and Tammy Cox. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Ricky, and I asked her earlier. I said, "You want me to introduce you as my wife or my rib?" I mean, either way, she's she's the best thing a part of me, so other than Jesus. But hey, I'd like to introduce. Uh, we've been uh, doing First Church for uh, about four years now. I guess this will be our fifth. Uh, but we truly are blessed. Uh, we don't feel like we we just open our heart in our house up because you know, we love Jesus and we love people. Uh, honestly, we're being fed by those that come to ours. Uh, we, you know, we share, we break bread together and just have a good time and uh, we learn more about our Lord as we open our, up our hearts and our minds to each other and uh, help each other through uh, this life and to uh, just share with Je uh, the experiences of Jesus in our lives. So we encourage you to come out, uh, get involved in our first church pastors and our groups, and let the Lord bless you through uh, each and every uh, time we get to uh, get together and break bread. So we love each and every one of you. And uh, at this time, uh, if y'all would stand with us, we have a tradition here at Bethesda. Uh, we have meet and greet, and at this time, uh, we just kind of go around and we uh, introduce to those, our guests, and uh, welcome them all. So at this time, go ahead and introduce.
was a wretch, I remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, the breach was far too wide. Well, from the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. There at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul, for the first time I had hope. And thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. And thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Oh, you took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting and life has no end for i have been transformed by the blood of the lamb thank you jesus for the blood of life thank you jesus it has washed me white Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light, because there is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the Calls the sons and daughters. We are ransomed by our Father through the blood. The blood. Come on, church. Because there is nothing stronger than the one working power of the blood. The blood that calls the sons and daughters we are ransomed by our father through the blood the blood cause there is nothing stronger than the one working power of the blood the blood that calls the sons and daughters, we are ransomed by our Father through the blood, the blood. One more time, because there is nothing stronger than the one working power of the blood, the blood that calls the sons and daughters. We are ransomed by our Father through the blood, the blood. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved my life, brought me from the dark.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, set a fire down deep in my soul. Everybody take a seat. Oh, what a wonderful day it is, right? What a wonderful day. I'll tell you, it, it started with a uh, long, long run this morning. And, and, and as I was running, I just said, Lord, I just never get tired of spending time with you. I want all your time. I, I, I don't want to just uh, be the morning time. I want it to be always, always, always sitting at your teeth. Uh, your, I said, I was about to say teeth. Uh, sitting at your feet <laughs> and just really sitting there and soaking up your presence and not asking you for a thing, but just sitting and listening and praying and just waiting for my father to speak. You know, this morning I was reminded of something that my mother told me. She said, you know, when, when you would call home and, and you, uh, you would tell your dad, your, uh, Dad, we're coming home this weekend, we're coming home this weekend, my mother told me that he would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and pace the, pace the house, pace the house, you know, and, uh, and, my, and my mother would look at him, my stepmother Kathy, and she'd say, Freddie, what are you doing? He said, my son's coming home today. So if my earthly father will get up at 5 a.m., knowing that I'm not going to be there till Dakota and Zach get out of the bed, right? But if my earthly father gets up at 5 a.m. and paces the floor anticipating his son to come home, man, how much more is our heavenly father pacing the floor in the morning waiting for us to come home? So I say that to introduce, uh, you know, I tell people when they come to my house, I say, if you've been there more than three times, you're no longer a guest, you're family. So Chris, uh, Joe, you're family now, right? So uh, Chris, uh, he's from the Everyman of Warrior team. Uh, what a phenomenal ministry this is. What a, uh, what a, listen, if you missed training yesterday, that's okay. Just come see us later. We'll get you, we'll get you spun up because it was just awesome. You know, uh, when, when myself, Pastor Doug, Gibson, uh, Richard, and Isaiah, uh, cruise the mountaintop up in the great state of Tennessee. Uh, 
man, it was just nonstop, boom, 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 boom. But you know what? On Sunday, when we got in the, in the car, and uh, I had to stop and get some swag before I left, but as I got in the car, I looked around, and except for Isaiah, because he sleeps all the time on the road. Uh, <laughs> but I looked, I looked around in the car, and every single guy in there, we were excited. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a challenge. It was you were up. You weren't. There was none of this downtime. You go hang out by the dumpster, or you know, hey, uh, we'll catch you back here in three hours. Go get some. No, it was regimental. Every single moment of the day was planned, which as a Marine, I'm all about, right? That was good to go. Uh, but then when we left, every single one of us were not tired. We were refreshed. We're, the spirit had been refreshed in us, and we were all the way home just, I mean, just excited, telling stories. Uh, just, man, you know, I, I thought me and Richard were just going to chest bump the whole way there. Uh, he finally gave out on me, I think, somewhere around Tennessee line and, and passed out of sleep on me somewhere. Uh, Pastor Doug was a trooper, though. He hung in there. Uh, but then yesterday, you know, uh, Chris and his team went all day long from 7.30 in the morning, and when he arrived, he said, man, I can't believe everybody's already here. Well, the men of Bethesda were excited. We were ready for training. We were ready to receive the word. We were ready to sharpen those skills. We were ready to take that dull axe and get that thing sharpened. So I'm not going to spoil everything that Chris is going to say because he is a phenomenal speaker. He's already told me, he said, you know, uh, I, I think we get along so well because he's from Chattanooga and I'm from Cleveland. We can spit on each other from where we're from. And, uh, man, I'm just going to have to make excuses to come see you just so I can go home. Uh, but, uh, you know, when we started talking about this conference thing, uh, we, 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 drink, we talked about a number, and then we just felt like the Lord uh, talked about another number. But, you know, the bottom line is, is all that were supposed to be there were there yesterday. Amen. All that were supposed to be there was there yesterday. And uh, I was just blown away by the teachings, by getting into the quiet times, by spending the time with the Lord, and just iron sharpened iron. You can't, you can't say that any other way. So Chris, uh, Chris asked me, he said, hey, how long do I got? So I asked myself, what would Brother Payne do? So, you know, Brother Payne says, get in, get out, or get ran over. So uh, I told Chris, I said, hey, man, they're conditioned. You got five hours, <laughs> right? Thanks, brother. <laughs> yeah, I, I tell you what, coming in yesterday, um, not only were we excited when we saw everybody here, well, even we came in the night before, um, there's a feeling in this church, guys. It's, uh, if you don't know it, it's not like this everywhere. It, it really isn't. It's, uh, it, it's, it's fun to come in and be welcomed and also to come in and, you know, I, we, we have that term preaching to the choir, right? That's kind of what it felt like because we were surrounded by men that were already focused on this call God has on our lives as men. And so we, we were super blessed by that. Continue to be super blessed uh, being here. Now, the reason I asked a lot of those questions to uh, Fred about you know, how much time and all that, I grew up in a tradition where uh, a guy was wearing a big black robe and he stood up in the box and everything was super well-timed. And so uh, uh, one of the beautiful things about being in a, in a ministry like Every Man or Warrior where we're, we're connected with so many different churches and even uh, like you saw in the video all over the world is you get the blessing of seeing the variety of what God does. And you find people that love God in so many different ways but authentically love him and want to serve him, and uh, it's, it's a blast. I, I, I love my job. I pinch myself that I get to work for a ministry and come around and talk to people like y'all. Um, so yeah, so my name's Chris Ackerson. I have been married to my wife for 30 years. Um, amen. We have four grown children that are uh, spread out. None of them are in Chattanooga with us anymore, so we, uh, as of about six months ago, have begun to learn what empty nesting looks like. Uh, woo! You can cheer for that, too. <laughs> Uh, we're pretty excited about that, uh, but we've lived in Chattanooga for 20, almost 25 years at this point, and uh, call it home and love it, and I was blessed there because I had a man who poured into my life. Even while I spent a season of my life, I, I'd grown up in church, I had wandered away, uh, Fred, to the University of Alabama. I, th I think Fred and I connected when I saw his email address had Bama at the front of it, and that gave us a bond. Uh, nobody would have accused me of following Jesus while I was uh, uh, at the university, and after we got married, and I still really wasn't following Jesus, the, the wheels kind of came off a little bit in our marriage as uh, we'd had our first two kids. And um, uh, I was blessed to go to one of these big men's conferences and hear some things where Jesus started drawing me back. Um, but when, when he did, I, I didn't really know what else to do other than to go back to church and become that good regimented church boy. 
Um, a guy in my first Everyman of Warrior group uh, gave me the term um, churchian. Hey, there's my water. Um, gave me the term churchian as opposed to Christian. And I think that was a good description of me. And so I spent about 10 years just, just being a religious guy. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'd fully qualify as a Pharisee, but I was certainly in that framework. And my kids had to ha- live through that. My wife lived through that, you know, where I was a different guy on Sundays than I necessarily was uh, other places. But I was blessed to have a man come into my life who spotted that. I see lots of those kind of men in this church for you young men that are, that are watching you and are not going to let you miss what God has in your life. And because of that guy, he brought me... Uh, uh, along with things he wrote out on napkins in, uh, in coffee shops and restaurants, and he was just teaching me from his heart. But this was a guy that really, he, he'd been in men's ministry for uh, probably 30 years, and had looked at things and had studied things, and he's a thinker. And um, we were actually working on a, on a ministry uh, thing that was his teaching, right? I was going to take his teaching, I was going to make it the next cool thing, and we were going to share it to the world, and we were about 95% done with that. And dadgum, and if that guy didn't show up, with this boring looking old man Bible study with these three books with a sword on the front. And I thought, oh, what has he found? Man, thank God for men who have wisdom and discernment and can see things because he spotted in every man of warrior something that was going to live out what we've been talking about. We've been talking biblically about what it looked like to be disciples and mature disciples and disciple makers. And we got the picture, but we weren't getting a lot of traction. And so um, I'm here to tell you, I, I got into Every Man a Warrior because I was forced to. Because that guy, had, he had relational capital with me, and he made me get in. So any of you young guys or any guys that have not been through it, if a guy that loves you and is in this church puts the pressure on you to get in, I'm going to tell you to do it. It changed my life. I'm, I'm a different man because of it. I'm, I, I don't promote Every Man a Warrior because I work for Every Man a Warrior. I am blessed to work for Every Man a Warrior because God changed my life through that ministry. It's exciting to hear when all y'all raised your hands and all you ladies that, that raised it. First, from that picture that uh, Lonnie gave in there, that uh, we truly believe this ministry came about because of the prayers of women. That uh, if probably in exasperation sometimes of, dear God, would you fix my husband? Would you do something, you know, the, these sons of mine are driving me crazy. Whatever the, the motivation was, but we believe those prayers were going on all over the world. We think these ministries that you see, like... Uh, uh, literally, there are 130 African men leaving a camp in Kenya right now, going back to 12 different countries that just did a leadership conference similar to what we did here yesterday in this room. Next week, there'll be over 100 men in Uganda doing this. Hey, we, we were talking about going to, um, uh, you guys going down to Peru, right, and, and uh, Colombia and the things that you do. We were talking about this. The Uganda conference that's happening next week, six years ago when I first came on staff, um, and I sent out the obligatory email, right, to all the people, hey, I'm going on this ministry staff, and I got a call from a guy who had been my high school ministry leader in a a ministry called Young Life, and uh, he lives in Knoxville, Tennessee, and he's worked for this uh, uh, other ministry for about 25 years up there, and he says, hey, Chris, congratulations on your new job, and I need more books. I'm like, well, what do you mean you need more books? I haven't even gotten started. I haven't told you about this. How do you know? Well, one, I tracked back and found out three generations above him was a guy involved in a business ministry that was using Every Man of Warrior five years before I knew it existed. And he'd shared it with a guy who had shared it with a guy who had shared it with my buddy. And so you got this beautiful generations there. But my buddy wanted books because he was headed to Uganda where he and some other men had helped start a ministry called the Jesus Leaders Network. And they work primarily with college-age men in the big cities of uh, Uganda. And so we sent him over with some books. We even got him permission to, for them to print some of their own books over there as they got started. And then things like COVID happened, and we were growing like a weed and figuring out what we were doing and kind of lost track. And um, we brought a new guy on to our staff as our Northwest director, a guy named Wayne Craig. And Wayne loves ministry in Africa. He'd been going to Africa for years. And he was, uh, he was discipling this young man who, uh, along with being a guy going through Every Man and Warrior, this young man was a Christian music artist in Uganda, like has songs on the radio. And uh, so about a year and a half ago, he writes a song, his first English-only song, and it's titled Every Man a Warrior. Cool Jamaican sounding song, right? Goes on the radio. And he starts getting phone calls from guys saying, why are you singing about my ministry, about this Bible study I'm going through? 
And Wayne starts doing the, I call it CSI disciple making sometimes as we work our way back and figure out, you know, who was the culprit in getting this started. It tracked back to my buddy that took a set of books with him on a short-term missions trip, and we found out there were 70 groups of men in Uganda, mostly young men in their late teens, early 20s, going through Every Man a Warrior. There was also a group of men that were all members of the Ugandan parliament. And we had no idea. Isn't that crazy? How, how God will take, it, it's not about every man a warrior, it's about men whose lives are changed and they can't help but want to go and share it with other people. It's exciting. So, so I get to do that. I, I joke and say my, my role in this, my mission field is the y'all states. So I serve all the states in the southeast where people say y'all, and I even will run down to some of those Florida people who aren't really southerners, but we like them anyway. Um, so that's my mission field, and I, I saw an interesting st uh, statistic, that you love statistics when somebody's talking, but it was some study somebody done looking at where Christianity uh, is in the world and how it's growing. Um, the great news is Africa has the highest number of Christians of any other continent in the world right now. They, they, are, they are driving a lot of what's going on in Christianity, and a lot of them are very solid um, uh, Bible-believing guys. The U.S. is shrinking. It's shrinking. It's, it, it was like 11% or less of the world's populations of Christians are in the U.S. And so I, I, I would argue that um, the mission field of the U.S. may be the most important mission field in the world. Uh, because we still have the greatest amount of resources. We still have the great, this great history. And I think the South in particular. I, I grew up a good Southern boy. We all went to church to make our mammals happy, right? So at least we got in there and we heard the word preached to us. And I'm convinced the burden that's on my heart, because it was me, that 10 years that I sat in the pews, that there is an army of men that are at least still circling our churches, even if they're not showing up in a, in a pew or a seat every Sunday, that are just waiting. They want to be taken out of being lukewarm guys, and they want to be warriors for Christ. That's the opportunity. How awesome it was hanging out with your guys and to see the intentionality in this church for that. So th thank you for letting me uh, come and be a part of that. Um, I'm going to share with you today, so I, I am not a sermonizer, I am not a pastor, I'm a trainer, teacher kind of guy, and so I was, I was sweating a little bit over, okay, what do I do when I get up in front of this church? And uh, Fred is very assuring, you know, when you say those things, just preach what's on your heart. And we talked yesterday after the, after the session, and and I've got some things that I am going to share with you. But he said, hey, share, share some of the details of what we're doing. And so I, I want to share with you guys why we think Every Man of Warrior is working the way that it is. We call it the engineering principles. Now, ladies, guys, guys love when we talk about engineering for some reason. They love skills. They love engineering. We use words that are very much toward men. But let me tell you, the things that make Every Man a Warrior work are absolutely as applicable to you ladies. That's why Cultivating Holy Beauty, we're excited it's there. We have a growing number of women around the world that are going through actual every man a warrior. They're like, we don't care if it's man stories. We want to learn these skills that our husbands have learned. Um, there's a lady in Albania that's translating it right now. She didn't ask. She just started translating. You know, we're in 27 languages now, and I don't know how many of them were translated by somebody that did it before they asked, but I bet it's more than 10 of them. They're just like, nope, love it, going to use it, translate it. Luckily, Lonnie's not a guy that's all tied up about, oh, no, that's my intellectual property rights. He's like, no, do it, do it, and it's beautiful. So, okay, so, so, so let me share some of this with you. Am I up on there? The beauty of PowerPoints for me is they, they just keep me on track, and I will sidetrack from them pretty regularly, but they sure do help me. So uh, I, I, I want to I share 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. Fred mentioned the... Uh, the time we spent up on the mountain, Lonnie had it in the video, and our key verse when we were up there um, uh, was verse uh, 10 out of uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. But let me read the whole thing. Uh, Word of God, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation, aw, aw, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day of judgment will bring it to light. 
It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Woo, that's some heavy-duty stuff, right? But you know what we see in that is we've got a choice. One, one, we lay on the foundation that is Jesus Christ. Fred said something awesome yesterday that if we let our foundation get cracked, that's where the enemy comes in. We need that solid foundation of Jesus. That's what we lay it on. And we are invited as followers of Christ to go lay that foundation in other people's lives. But we also have a choice of how we do it. And, and again, I, I don't mean to be, you know, puffing y'all up, but you, you guys are working very intentionally to put some foundational pieces in place between all these different schools that you're doing. You're not just randomly throwing stuff at it. You guys have got a plan. Again, that's not super normal, okay? But we get a choice of what we're going to do. We get to choose the materials uh, that we're going to use to build disciples. And this ties into to why we believe every man or warrior is working. And so we're going to talk about engineering principles. You can hit my next slide. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about six different things uh, today, and, and we'll dive deeper into one of them, and the others we'll just touch. Um, but we believe these are important things that are making our ministry work. Let's go to the next slide. If you want to change a culture for Christ, you heard Lonnie say this in the video, we believe you have to reach the men. That does in no way diminish the ministry to you women, to you children, um, but there are some realities in that when we go to scripture, God focused on men and gave us some responsibilities and some challenges that, you know what, one of the problems in our world is we don't really want it. It's not like we're cheering that he gave it to us. Most men are running from it. But he gave us that responsibility, and so we've got that piece biblically that we have to focus on the men. It's God's plan for how we lead our families and lead our communities and lead our churches, and so we've got to do that. Um, the other part is the kind of the flip side of it. An undiscipled, immature man causes havoc. Uh, if you want to see the places that causes problems for women and children, you will find an immature man who has not been taught how to be the man God intended him to be. So we've got, if you're going to change the culture for Christ, we have to get them in. Um, to get them in, though, uh, is not always done in the fashion that uh, the typical church does. If you're going to get them in, you've got to be practical and relevant to them. You've got to address the issues where their fear of failure is the highest, the places where they're stressed the most. So where do men spend 90% of their energy, at least in their anxiety and their fears, it's money, it's marriage, it's raising children, it's work, it's sex and moral purity, it's figuring out, guys, my life even going to count for anything. So if we just come at men with theology or doctrine, those are good things, they're valuable, we need them, but if we don't help men address and, and win the battles that they fight every day, they're going to disengage, that they're not going to be drawn in. That's why you know, they, they, they like to see a manly man who loves them, but will challenge them uh, to grow in their lives. So if we want to change a culture for Christ, we've got to get them in. That's our first engineering principle. Second one is a, a biblical template uh, for effective men's ministry. Uh, you want to get that next one? Next slide. There we go. I'm going to do the, the point. Um, we think it's important. I have a lot of real, I think I have a lot of really good ideas and I plan things out and I like to structure them. And so we can very easily get off into making our own plan for how we want to do things. And I think God gifted us to think through things. Um, but we believe it's very important uh, if you're going to invest in men, you better have a template that's based on God's word and not our word. And so this picture is our simple template in Every Man a Warrior of how we've kind of gone after that. Um, but what we believe, and a lot of this comes from, uh, you can go to the next slide, a lot of this comes from the, uh, the scriptures in Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3. And here's the descriptions. You may not be able to read that. I know that's small. But these are the scriptures. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel you guys. Why, why, do, why do you think I have an iPad up here because I can't read that back there? I, I feel your pain back there. Um, these are the, the scriptures that talk about what an elder or a deacon should look like, right? It gives all the qualifications. But what we believe we see in this is that uh, God, and through Paul in these, is pointing to the need for us to develop godly character. Uh, this is what these scriptures point to. And interestingly, they also talk about 2,000 years ago, guys were dealing with the exact same challenges we are today. Marriage, raising children, money, work, sex, more purity, work, how to make their lives count. Um, go to the next slide. 
So you can see visually, again, I, I'm not expecting you to be able to read it, but you can see from the colors, there are over 19 character issues that are addressed just in these two passages. 19 different things. Character is important to God, and when we talk about being transformed, I, I think this is a key thing God is transforming in us, and it is our character. And so as we keep looking through this, uh, you can go to the next slide. These building blocks, we need to have blocks that begin to build character. Now, every man a warrior, uh, probably much like uh, cultivating holy beauty, let's start where Jesus started. Our first three building blocks are really looking at, hey, how did Jesus walk through this? And the first thing, we, we all memorize, you guys that have been through it, we memorize Matthew 22, 36 to 38. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord. I love seeing you guys say it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. I remember that light bulb going on in my head going through every man a warrior the first time because of course I knew that scripture. I was a good churchy and I had heard that scripture lots of times. But I had never caught that emphasis that Jesus said this was the first and the greatest. He doubled down on it. Um, I was a guy that wanted to jump straight to the Great Commission because that let me get busy. All right? But Jesus didn't give the Great Commission first. He gave the Great Commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And yes, he went on and said love your neighbors as yourself, but that was second. First, we've got to establish this intimate relationship with God. And so that's what we begin with with men and every man a warrior. We've got to go back to the basics. Most, uh, most of my experience and most churches I get into, even a lot of other ministries, I think they start at like two and three and four hundred level teaching. And they're good. It's, it's, it's not bad teaching. But we, we don't do that with our kids when we teach them things. You don't start them at upper level. You've got to start them in kindergarten and first grade. You've got to teach them the basics. Guys didn't start in the Marines, right, Fred, without going to, you didn't want a guy in your group if he hadn't been through basic training and proved his mettle and learned the skills. We've got to do that. Uh, and there's a lot of us men, I was one of them, that we've got to step back and catch up. And sometimes it, that, that takes some humility on a lot of church guys' parts to step back and say, I might have missed something. Right. Yeah. I told the story yesterday. For me, I was in that first group that my, that my mentor made me get into. I got forced to be in there. And uh, you know, I, I kind of thought this was an old man looking Bible study. And so to help me with that, to be gentle as he put me into a group, it was him. He was 69. Two 75-year-olds. One uh, uh, died in the World Pentecostal. He'd have been up here with the flag. He was, that guy was great. Um, a guy called the Baptist of Baptist. Just steady, eddy, everything. And then a, a retired Nazarene pastor. So how about that for a, for a guy that was worried about it being an old man Bible study? Well, we were about five or six chapters into the first book. We've begun to learn this skill of quiet time. And the Baptist of Baptist walks in, an even-keeled guy, and he slaps that book down on the table and says, nobody's ever taught me this. I'm like, what are you talking about? Baptist of Baptist? I mean, you know, you know it all. His picture is literally on the wall of the Baptist Men's Retreat Center in Apison, Tennessee, close to where Fred is from. Um, we said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, look, for 50 years, I have faithfully gotten up and had my quiet time. I get up at 5 or 5.30 in the morning. I get my daily devotional. Uh, he liked Oswald Chambers, so probably nine years out of 10, he was reading my utmost for his highest. So we'd look at the, the uh, devotional for the day. He says, I'd look up the scripture. I would spend time praying for my family, my friends, my church, all those things. Everything about that good. Nothing wrong with any of that. But here's what he said with the Holy Spirit really gri gripped my heart. Us Presbyterians don't get gripped by the Holy Spirit like we should, right? So sometimes it'll surprise us when he sneaks up on us. Uh, he says this, he says, all these years I've been reading Oswald Chambers' quiet time and nobody taught me how to have my own. Yeah. 75 years old. That guy started about five groups. He died before he ever finished every man of warrior. But he had already planted seeds with guys because he said there was something I missed in all my great church life. Great man, great husband, great father. He was, he was uh, humble enough. And God used that to humble me, for me to go, yeah, I need to step back and take a look at this. So, man, I told you guys I was going to sidetrack since Fred said I could go anywhere with this. <laughs> okay, so we lay our first foundational block. We call this our building blocks of disciple making. We start uh, with our love relationship with God. Uh, we've got to have intimacy with him as, as our true foundation. Um, next slide. All it does is highlight the next thing. What do we see out of Jesus' life, though? How did he live it out? There were two key things that we feel like it, it's most basic that we see out of Jesus. He was a man of the word. You know, from the very beginning of his ministry, right after he 
uh, heads out into the wilderness and the enemy comes after him, what does he do? He quotes scripture. He knows the word. We see it all through his ministry. He answers questions with the word. Um, and so if we're going to follow Jesus' model, we need to be men of the word. And so we begin to teach guys. So we do simple things that guys get the big eyes sometime, right, about this memorizing scripture. Fred's on it, man. He's, he's not going to let you slide on that scripture. Uh, we memorize it word for word, not because that makes you more holy, but because it's a good training exercise. It raises the bar. When we're training men to be leaders, we don't want to lower that bar. We want to have high standards. So we teach men how to memorize the word, how to meditate on the word and ask questions and dig deeper. Um, and then we teach them uh, about prayer. There's a lot of us that grew up on prayer that was pretty uh, regimented. Yeah, you know, we, we hadn't really learned. I had not really learned how to have personal prayer with the God of the universe. We need it. He speaks to us through his word and he speaks to us through his still quiet voice when we will be quiet long enough, uh, if we'll shut up long enough to listen, right? Um, so we start to help men to do that. We do this all with very basic things. So we lay that foundation based on the life of Christ in a man's life. My passion is for the lukewarm guy in the church that's been hanging out all these years and doesn't even know he's missing out on this, is to help those guys step back and get these basic skills. All right, next, uh, next slide, maybe even two slides. Yeah, go to the next one because we've already highlighted prayer. Um, so we are dealing with godly character. This is what we're developing in men, starting with those basics. Go to the next slide. But as we go back to these verses, look at this. This is all the verses that talk about um, marriage and raising children. So you can visually see this was a big topic for that. Uh, these are the primary relationships that God gives us as men for us to lead in. And so we need to have a building block for that. Next slide. So we've got a building block for marriage and raising children. I'm going to go through these pretty quick. So um, if you go to the next one, you're going to see a proper perspective on money. Now, you don't see as much color on this and that, but when you pair that with the fact that Jesus talked about money 55 plus times in Scripture, it's a pretty big deal. And it's not just about the money itself. It's about how we get the money, right? He talks about it here. He, he doesn't, can't be a man of dishonest gain. All right, so we, how we carry ourselves at work. We had a great conversation yesterday um, uh, with Nate about working uh, at work and going, man, how do I make a difference? And the potential for him, the way he lives his life at work, for people from a distance to be able to see the fruit of his life. It was a great conversation. All right? so, so how we get our money, how we invest our money, how we steward our money. Uh, Fred talked about it great. You guys have been talking about giving today. This is all God's money. We just got to learn to have the proper perspective on it. So we're going to help men do that. So we have a block for money and work. Um, go to the next one with the red letters. Uh, he does talk about uh, sex and moral purity in here. Guys, this is a cancer in our world. In our church world, it's a cancer. It's a problem. I mean, just look at what's going on in our world out there. And so this is one of the calls for men is to get a grip on this. What, what did, how did God call us to deal with this? He created this part of who we are. There's a natural right way for it, but we better help guys get it right. And uh, so we address it in the first three books, but we realized it was a bigger issue than that could carry. Fred mentioned there's a fourth book. It's all about helping men deal with addictive behaviors. It's for men that have already been through all three books of Every Man a Warrior because it's going to use that skill set. But we've got to help men address this issue if they're going to have the character to be the leaders, the men that God calls them to be. So we've got a block for sex and moral purity. All right, so we finally got to the Great Commission. Like I said, I was the kind of guy that wanted to get to the Great Commission. I like to start there because it lets me be busy. But if we're going to live out the Great Commission, this call Jesus gave us to go into all the world, um, you know, therefore as you go, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And I shared with these guys yesterday, I had a quiet time, I don't know, two or three years into Every Man a Warrior, and we learned how to dig into words, right, to look a little deeper in our meditation. And I got shocked when I, I don't know, I was looking at Blue Letter Bible or something that dug deeper than I normally do, and I realized that that you, when it says all that I've commanded you, is a singular pronoun. I remembered enough of my high school English to know that that meant it was talking to me, not you, the church, but he's saying, go and teach them all I've commanded you. I had that attitude in my head. Well, I better know everything. I better be ready for every question that comes my way. It's a lie of the devil. 
If all you know is that Jesus said, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself, if you know those two things, and you know he said, go share that with other people, you know enough to go start making disciples. Because he's commanded that to you. Now, along the way, if you start digging into Scripture, guess what? He'll keep teaching you more things that you can then share. This is why we share quiet times in our Every Man of Word groups and in our Cultivating Holy Beauty groups. It's because it's a chance for us to share what God has put on our hearts. Helps us grow. So, um, how important is it that we have a biblical template? It is key. It is key. Pay attention, because we won't be the only tool that you use, but pay attention to the things that you use and make sure, and I can already tell this happens here. So some other places probably need more encouragement on that. But go make sure it's based on the way God laid it out to be, not just because some man like me has had a great idea. So follow that. Um, has one thing we have learned, uh, you can go to the next slide, is that uh, you cannot make leaders in a smorgasbord fashion. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. There's a lot of really good stuff out there. And again, I, I know I keep praising you because I've been impressed with the church. But you guys are working hard to have a, um, a realistic, a plan, a process for people to go through. Unfortunately, the easy road for a lot of people is there's all these great different resources out there. Just keep throwing them at the wall and hope stuff sticks. That was what my life looked like in that ten, those 10 years that I was a church in. Is, uh, I had what we've, we've now started to call the, uh, the random walk. And so it wasn't that I didn't get some good things, but I couldn't walk somebody else through it. And so we want to help people avoid a smorgasbord approach and be focused on the fact that we're developing leaders. Okay, I'm going to try and go through these other ones pretty quick here. Uh, the next uh, engineering principle is that if, uh, if you're going to train men, you've got to have teaching methods that impact retention and learning. Now, this is great that I'm up here teaching and that we've got a, a good PowerPoint because that helps keep me a little bit on track. But we're really in a passive learning mode. Now, that's not bad. We need the passive learning mode. But if this study is right, you can, uh, it's probably hard for you. How, how well can you guys see that? Oh, that's not bad. Um, we've learned that what I'm doing up here, if I'm just talking, this study indicates that only about 5% of what I say will be remembered. Um, a lot of times when people talk about this, they'll make that joke. That, that, well, they make the joke. But the joke is the only thing that gets remembered in a lot of sermons. Uh, Fred, we were talking about when you left the church in Cleveland and you were shocked that people weren't talking about what was discussed uh, in the sermon because most of it goes in and goes out. Um, it's still an important 5%, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, I, I, that's not to degrade that at all, but let's recognize how we learn. We need to help men get into active learning. So we did this yesterday. For you guys that were here, this is why we gathered around tables. We had great discussion. We did practical exercises. Uh, for some guys that had already been in Every Man a Warrior, it was just a brush up and a, and a help in how they would share it with somebody else. We had some new guys that learned some new skills yesterday, but we got them putting pencil to paper in the Word of God. We didn't just talk about it, we did it. Um, and one of the key things to the success of Every Man a Warrior, you hear about all this generational growth, is because we teach men and challenge men that they've got to go on and teach others. Because to get to A-level retention, you've got to share what you've learned. Again, we do this in a micro sense when we share quiet times. When you share what you learned in a quiet time with somebody, God uses that to lock it into you. It's not just for that person you're sharing it with. It's more about you when you teach somebody. So we've got to use methods uh, that move guys out of passive and into active learning, and this is one of our targets in Every Man of Warrior. Next slide. This next one was super helpful to me. This got introduced when we were up on the mountain, you guys that were up there when we had that leaders conference. I, I had a challenge a lot of times when I would go out to churches to talk to pastors or men's leaders that it, I could tell it was coming across like I had shown up with my Every Man of Warrior logo on and I was here to tell them what they were doing wrong and I had the right answer. And I think that's happened to pastors a lot. There's a lot of people out there trying to tell them they've got the next uh, great thing. And we did not want to be that. And so we wrestled with this. Uh, you know, what is it we're sharing with people? And so this is how we, we came up with it. To talk about discipleship, we need to define that clearly. Because discipleship has come to mean a whole lot of stuff, right? We can, we can do almost anything in the church, and somebody will put the word discipleship on it. But we've got to be more clear in that. So we look at it in terms of three different ways we think discipleship in general happens in the church. And one is this. One is the lecture format. Somebody gets up front and shares the word of God. Um, now, our learning pyramid says 5% retention rate. But you know what? That 5% is what has led a whole lot of people to Jesus. A lot of evangelism happens in that scenario, whether it's the church service, the big men's event like I went to, a men's retreat. Now, 
I loved it when Lonnie added this. You know how we know this is important? What does it say on the screen? Jesus did it. Jesus preached to the masses. He taught. It's important. We've got to have that in our lives. This is important. The second one is uh, what we call small group format. Now, I hear you guys talk about first church. And um, you guys describe being, or somebody described being in the first church for four or five years. It was you guys. Being in there, th this is where you gather together. You guys talk about having meals together. This is so important in the life of the church. The small group is where we develop community and fellowship. And they may be widely varying in size. Sometimes they're all men and all women. Sometimes they're couples. Now, some of my best small groups, I think, have been with couples. Because this, these are the people we walk through life with. And we need that. We know it's important because we see Jesus doing it. It was, kind of the, it was kind of the sides of his ministry, right? You know, he meets Zacchaeus, go to the house and have dinner. He meets Matthew and invites him in, go to the house and have dinner. He was always hanging out with people. And I can only picture him walking around with all the disciples. I said this yesterday. Um, we've, we've all gone camping. It's cool when you sit around the fire pit and you get in the best conversations. And those guys went on long walks together. Uh, they built relationships. We know this is important because Jesus did it. The third thing, though, is leadership development. This is where we believe every man a warrior solidly fits. This is what we're after. Um, one, we believe this is truly men with men, women with women. God's got that design. We think it's important. Uh, we find that small groups are the best way to do this. We say four to six guys in a group, maybe, maybe seven. I think seven's too big, to be honest with you, uh, because it's a relationship-building time. It's an accountability time. If it gets too big, we've just watched it. You lose that connection that lets you hold each other accountable. It also works great one-on-one, -on -one, the apprentice model. Um, I tried to avoid that at one point. I, I'll share a picture later of, of God's answer when Chris decided he wasn't going to do one-on-one -on -one and what God did, and you can probably guess where it's going to go. Um, but this is where we're focused on transformation, on equipping people to then be able to go out and multiply, not just to do stuff, but to multiply, train people, train people, train people, passing the love of Christ down. Unfortunately, in the church, if we were looking at this in little circles, that last one would be pretty small in the overall church. Um, you guys, again, are being very intentional with your schools to make sure that you've got training for leadership. This is why Every Man Award is working, because we're focused on that. Next slide. We also have a step-by-step a, a -step process. Now, this is ours. Um, you guys probably, somewhere on some whiteboard, you guys have probably drawn out the process of things that you're working on. Men need to know what the steps are and what the process is. Uh, so for us in this, I'm not going to break this whole thing down, but the bottom is book one. We get guys the basic skills, that angle part up. We're going to train them in those skills. Uh, we're going to use those skills to train them in these key areas of life uh, so that they at least have the basics of being a spiritual leader. We've given them that, that first bedrock. But it's really a two-year cycle. If you really want to get every man a warrior locked in, for you guys that have been through it once, you need to lead a group. You need to be asking God for men for you to take through because it's more about you and what you learn then it will be about those guys. God will bless you by your willingness to go pour into other men's lives, and you don't have to figure it out from scratch because every man of warrior will give you a checklist week in and week out to let you go do that. I'm, I'm telling you, it will bless you. I, I just finished my 23rd group, and it was just as good, and it was just as hard. I, it's, I, I just keep doing it. I mean, it's not, it's not that I'm doing anything. One, I get to do it as a job, so okay, let's give it that. But if you just did one a year, I'm telling you, the blessing that builds up in that is amazing. And we use that step-by-step -step process to teach skills. And I told you we like that word with men, men get skills. And so we're going to the next slide. We use these building blocks. We take a building block. It's the love relationship with God. That's our first one. Um, we teach a skill. We teach guys the simple quiet time. Because we've got an objective, an outcome, a man who walks with God and is transformed in his life. So we've got purposes behind all these. We're not just doing stuff. They have very specific reasons to do it. All right, last one in, in, in this little section right here. Uh, this was another bit. Th this one really challenged me. This is what we call the seven levels of being a man of the word or seven levels of meditation. Because we were a little worried, even as we grew, that there's a risk when you, when you do something training-wise like this, that you just, you, you may accidentally create little robots that are out there. I have memorized all the scripture, and I can quote the word of God, and I have had X number of quiet times, and give me my star. That is not what we're after. Uh, we'll use every man of warrior during the season that you're in it. Yes, we will hold you accountable to all those things, because those are training processes. 
but we need men to do something different. So this is how we begin to look at it with these seven levels. The first one, and these, may, these should sound familiar to everybody, the first level is you've heard scripture, but you've really forgotten it. You know, this is what's going on in the world, and we've all got a whole bunch of, there, there's scriptures out there we've heard that we cannot bring to mind. We all have level one scriptures. Level two scriptures, I've heard it, I know it well enough that I could get out my iPad or my iPhone, I could probably get enough of the right words in that I could find it. Now, I value that. I got a whole bunch of level two scriptures floating around, and I really appreciate the age God put me in that I can go look it up on my phone. Great, all right? But moving on to level three, we may have heard it. We may have even studied it. Now, this is when Lonnie started getting into our business as church people, right? We may have been in a small group that studied this stuff, but if all we did was study it and get knowledge about it and it didn't move down into our hearts, we're still just at head knowledge. We're still not moving along. So we move to level four. This one hurt my feelings as an every man a warrior guy when he put in the middle memorized scripture. Because we memorize scripture. That's one of the things we're known for, right? You see guys walking around with their cards and they're quizzing each other. They get their wives to quiz them. But it's in the middle. If all we've done is memorize scripture so we can show off with it, we're, we're going to miss the point. Jesus told the, the Pharisees, right? He said, you're in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. These were the most educated guys. To become a Pharisee, you had to have memorized word for word all five books at the beginning of the Bible. But he said, you're in error because you don't know the scripture or the power of God. We want guys to know the power of God. And so we've got to move them on to five. We've got to get guys meditating on the word, digging deep, and listening to what God is saying to them through the scripture. Because this is where he begins to build conviction. And conviction is what leads to going, well, I better do something with it. You know, don't be merely hearers of the word, but be doers. Don't just listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So we got it. For guys to get there, though, they've got to dive deeper into the word. So then we move to level six. If they've done that and they, they take God's push, that conviction, and they begin to live it out in their lives, what happens is they build a story. We heard testimonies yesterday. Four different guys shared their testimony. That's what letting God work in our lives does. It creates a story. And then level seven is we don't just hold on to that story in ourselves. We take it and share it with other people because the impact that God has on our lives, that's what attracts people. Right. People want to see that, that Jesus means something to us. If we're just showing up at church and being like I was a churchian, it's not very attractive. You know, my, my kids haven't walked away from the faith, but they're not like heavily embraced. My daughter is, but my three sons, they watch me be a churchian and they are still paying attention to me today. Um, luckily, we're starting to get some traction. They're going, okay, Dad's serious. That church guy that I knew growing up is different. We build a story in our lives. So, so those are our engineering principles for why we believe every man a warrior is working. Um, and they're practical, and they're useful, and they're tactical. And because of them, all these stories that you saw, not only us spreading out into 50 states, being in 58-plus countries, 27 languages translated. We've got 40 international staff. All that was done with no plan. It was just men being changed by God and just being compelled to go share it with others. So that's where we see every man a warrior working. This is what's happening here. It's in the mix with you guys, right? It's not the only thing that you do, but boy, it's a great tool to be calling guys in. And what we talked some about yesterday, seeing it bust out of the walls of here. You, know, you run out of guys here pretty quick, right? The way this thing grows. So, so that's what we're praying for with you guys. All right, I, I said that, that was the preamble. How about that? I told you, Pastor Fred said you could talk as long as you wanted here. Um, let me, uh, let's go to that, say that again, Fred. Woohoo! So I want to share this with you that uh, we, we went through this yesterday. If, if I say I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, it means it won't go quickly, but... Um, we ended yesterday with this conversation. We had that other uh, PowerPoint ready to come up. The you were called to be great. Ah, there we go. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. We, we talked about this idea that you were called to be great. Now, we talked to the men about it, but ladies, let me tell you, this message is absolutely for everybody. This is not just a man message. You were called to be great in the kingdom of God. So we looked at 1 Corinthians earlier, but we're going to back up and, and read a little ahead of those things about being an expert builder. Uh, this is what it says. What after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants to whom you came to believe. 
as the Lord has assigned to each his task. God's got work for you to do. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. Those two things. Each, each will get a reward. Hang on to that thought. But how about this? We are God's fellow workers. Amen. So think about it in your life, whether it might be in your marriage, it might be at work. There's been things you've done in your life where you've had that person that you work side by side with that you just knew you could count on. Well, when we're called to do work for God, when he's got a task for us to do, guess who our fellow worker is? It's the God of the universe. That's kind of hard to grasp. But it's the God of the universe that's there to help us. Lonnie shared a funny story when he first gave this talk when we were up on the mountain in Tennessee. Uh, he'd gotten a call from a friend of his uh, who had been spending some time in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So his buddy had been studying that, and he said he had a dream uh, one night while he was sleeping. He had to call and tell Lonnie about it. He said, in my dream, I was an ox, and I'm about to get yoked up with Jesus. Except I'm this little bitty ox, and Jesus is this great big ox. And he said, so in the dream, when Jesus and I go out to work the fields, he's really doing 98% of the work, but he's letting me be in there with him, working side by side. Maybe picture with my kids, right, when your kids were little, and you do something with them, and they think they're doing it, and you're really behind pulling the, the, the rope. I thought, what a great picture of that, that if God's called us to do something, he is not sending us out there on our own. He is there to be our fellow worker. So when you hear this, this statement we make, that you are called to be great in the kingdom of God, it's pretty easy for us to want to shrink back. And go, oh, no, that's not me. That's those other guys. You know, those are those guys that were the word pastor or work for a ministry. It's not me. No, no, it's you are called to be great, and God has work for you to do. So what's the obvious work we've got to do? You can do the next slide. We've already talked about the Great Commission. There's a clear call for the mission that we are called to. He tells us, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. We're super excited that every man and warrior is broke out of the U.S. and is going everywhere. It feels like just such a joy that God's letting us be a part of going to the nations. You guys go to Peru, and you go to to uh, Colombia, you're reaching out to the nations. Here's one thing about being in the U.S., the nations are coming to us, guys. We don't have to travel everywhere to, to serve the nations, and don't forget we are a nation. Don't forget these states, Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, those all started out as basically little nations. These are places God calls us to go and serve. So we've got a model in every man of Orient that says, okay, how could this happen? Give me the next slide. There we go. So this is what we, uh, we, we kind of envision with every man and warrior, what we feel like we see happening, right? So in that upper left, you've got, if you and five guys start a group and half of you go on and multiply, the next year you would have 24 men. If it happened again, the next year you'd have 72 men, then 216 men, 648 men. Feels like multi-level marketing, doesn't it? They have multi-level marketing. I think Jesus was the first multi-level marketer. D does it happen like this? No, it's messy. The potential is absolutely there. It could even be greater. So we could put anything on a slide. And show, I could have put 10 million people on a slide and said, hey, that's where we're going. Um, but what does it really look like? Give me the next slide. So Bob is a guy that uh, lives in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, and he found, gets introduced to every man of warrior, another retired Marine. Uh, he starts his first group, a big group, bigger than my, we might uh, uh, coach people to have, but he had eight graduates that first year. Of those eight guys, five of them went on and led their own groups. And those guys, I can't read now, now I'm with you guys, I got to turn around to be able to read the, the thing. Now those five guys, 23 graduated, 11 go on and uh, lead groups, 40 graduates, 15 go on and lead, 56 graduates, 127 men in just four years. And that's going on. This was real life. This was this was people with skin on. This wasn't stick men on my, on my PowerPoint. These were real guys. Uh, Bob, because of uh, how this gripped him, he came on staff like me. He was our Southwest director. 
He's no longer our Southwest director because he just moved to Scotland and he is now our European director. He married a Scottish girl and we've got a bunch going on over there and they, they, needed, they needed a shepherd. So he has moved on to that. G give me the next slide. Now I love this slide because I'm in it a lot. This is Chattanooga. So the guy in the upper right is that guy I told you about that forced me to be an Everyman Warrior. His name's Bernie. Here's what's awesome in that upper picture. Every single one of those men represents a generation. That's not an Everyman Warrior group. That's Bernie, who led me, who led Keith, who led Jerry, and on down the line. And there's another group going with that last guy right now. Generations of leaders. Those are real dudes. I didn't believe this would happen when Bernie first showed up with us. When Lonnie said half the men that go through all three of these books will go on and lead groups, I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not buying it. I've been around church too long. That's not going to happen. We watch it happen. Now, we, we've got one outlier with the dentist that's kind of toward the middle there as, as a guy that's under 40. But after that, every other guy is over 55 years old. Bernie was 69 years old when he led his first group. So if any of you guys... Now, if there's any older guys in here that think, well, I've kind of already passed my prime with that, it's a lie of the devil. It's a lie of the devil. God's got work for you to do. The bottom one right there where you see me, I, I cut Bernie off to make it fit. He's actually supposed to be in that picture as well. Those are all generations of guys. I told you, you know, I tried to avoid doing one-on-one. -on -one. God thumped me, and I had to do a one-on-one -on -one with a young man that came, and it's that guy standing beside me. His name's Kyle. Kyle's 24 years old, and he's four generations deep as a disciple maker. And dummy me almost walked away from him because I was wanting to do a group. Sometimes we got to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit, right? You know, let's, let's pay attention. We keep, I, I get my ideas. I need to follow his ideas. How beautiful is that? The, the guy's kind of in the middle right. Carl in the middle of that is one of our uh, staff guys now. He was also in an original group of Bernie, uh, of, of Bernie's groups. He was a children's pastor. At a, at a Baptist church down in Chattanooga. And he began to farm the children's ministry of his big church. He would watch those dads coming in, bringing their kids into Sunday school. And he looked for those dads and pray, who are the ones God wants me to lead? Uh, the bald guy standing beside him is Scott. He met, Scott was visiting the church one day. And Carl says, God told me that's your guy. And he invited Scott into a group. Scott knew nothing, and the Spirit had to have moved on him, got in a group. Scott's four or five generations deep. That's, that's a group of men at his office. He led a bunch of guys in an HVAC business through Every Man a Warrior. My last, I love these stories. My last one, upper left, I joke, say, I love that picture because of the diversity in the picture. And, of course, everybody, when you look at it, immediately thinks, well, yeah, that's because there's some black guys and there's some white guys. And that's good. We see a lot of that in, in Every Man of Warrior. But here's the diversity I love in that picture. The guy on the far left is a Seventh-day Adventist. The next guy is out of the Church of God. The next guy is a Baptist. And the next two guys go to a non-denominational church. And they were a group. And every one of those guys has multiplied. When we just get down to the basics of let's listen to Jesus and look for his truths and be in the scripture, all this other junk washes away. Let's go and make disciples of these guys. All right, next picture. This is not a new idea. God has been talking to us about the work he has for us to do. He has modeled it from day one. In Genesis, what's the first thing he does? Genesis 1.28 in the kind of big picture he tells us, as, uh, he tells Adam and Eve as the first man and woman uh, to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. He started off with an awesome job for us to go and make the kids and grow the world. In 2.15, he's kind of backed up, right, in, in the way Genesis tells the story, but God plants the garden and he puts Adam in it, his first thing, and says, you're to tend and care for the garden. He had work for Adam to do. In 2.19, I think this is my favorite job Adam got, Adam got to name all the animals. God brings him in from the very beginning. God had work for us to do. Now, the fall happens in, in chapter 3, and we start to muck things up. And by the time we get to chapter 6, God's ready to hit the reset button, right? But he looks down and he sees Noah. And what does he recognize about Noah? Noah's a righteous man who walks with God. This is, where, this is the verse Lonnie took the title for our first book, Walking with God. Because we see that, and God had work. When he saw that man who was following him, he had work for him to do. A big job. That's a big job to build the ark. 
And then after the ark, what did he do? He repeated the original instruction, be fruitful and multiply, to go out and fill the earth. Fast forward a few hundred years more, we get to Abraham, he plucks this guy out, and he gives Abraham this just regular dude, he's, like, he's a shepherd out there, right? And says, I'm going to build a mighty nation out of you. Whew, God's got work for us to do. How do you feel if you got that assignment? I'm going to build a mighty nation. And he goes on through, through the Old Testament and Scripture, and we see that whole picture of how he builds this nation, and they're snotty, and they're, and they're rotten a lot of times, but he loves them, and he keeps going back to them, and he cares for them, and the nation grows. Um, and Isaiah, to that Jewish nation, he gives them this charge. It, it, it's, it's prophecy looking to the future when he says to the Jewish nation, you will be a light to the Gentiles. To the nations. And if you remember in all the history we read in there, the Jews didn't really like all that business, right? They pushed back against that pretty hard. So when you get to Acts and uh, Paul and Barnabas are out talking in, in one of the cities as they travel and they're talking to the Jews and they're sharing to them about Jesus. And what do those Jews do? They start to heap abuse on them, right? They, don't, they do not like it. They're jealous of what's going on. And so what do Paul and Barnabas say? Hey, we had to preach to you first, but now we are called to be lights to the Gentiles. They quote the Isaiah verse because God had a plan all along. He used his Jewish nation, his chosen people to model who he is, but from the beginning, he had a plan for it to go to the world. So God's got work for us to do. We're a part of that. He's called us to be great in his kingdom to be a part of what he's asked us to do. So why isn't it working? Why don't we see more? Why aren't we taking over the whole world? Why is it not working? Give me the next slide. We think there's three key reasons that it hadn't been happening. No one's taught us how. It's my story that I, that I tell you. I sat in pews for a long time, and nobody had taught me how to go and make disciples. The other is that we're at war. We have a real enemy. Again, I, you know, I, I kind of joke about you know, my, where my background is in my faith tradition. We did not talk about spiritual warfare. I had to get educated by that, and I was a little resistant. And luckily, Lonnie's take with me when we started talking about, hey, spiritual warfare is real, was... Go to the scripture and just ask God for the truth. We need more people to go to the scripture and understand we have a real enemy who's out there who's working against us. They also need to understand he has no power. He's a liar. He's an insurgent, right? He has to sneak in and do things. He wants to try and crack our foundation, and he's pretty good at it. But he's really good at it if we don't even know we're in the fight. So we've got an enemy that doesn't like this. We've got to fight him. And then here's, I think, the big. It's going to cost you something. Um, um, I think it was uh, Bonhoeffer that talked about cheap grace. right? We want that grace where we get that ticket to heaven and everything's smooth sail. And some people even tell people that when they're inviting them to Jesus. Oh, if you find Jesus, everything's going to be great from here on out. Jesus didn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that. Uh, troubles will come our way. And we'll struggle through them. It will cost us something to take on the work that Jesus calls us to, that God the Father has work for us to do and wants us to be great, but it'll cost us something. But are we willing to pay the price? Again, my fear is, in my scope of the world, guys like me sitting in church pews are not willing to pay the price because they haven't been given the clear picture of what they're called to. We don't, dis we don't just disciple guys because it's the rule in the Bible. I heard this from a guy just last week, and it stuck with me. The reason we want to disciple men and disciple women is because we want them to get the life they deserve that Jesus promised them. We want them to have it. And so we've got to decide if we're willing to pay the cost. So if you look at your Bibles in Matthew 16, 21 to 27, I'll just kind of paraphrase 21 to 23. This is when this is when Jesus has got the, the apostles together, and he gives them the real clear cut what's about to happen. He's going to be crucified. And uh, what does Peter do? Peter says, nope, never going to happen. Boom, that Peter guy, buddy, sticks it in there. And remember how Jesus responds? Get behind me, Satan. I was actually looking at this this morning when I was going through, and I was having my quiet time over these verses. <clears throat> And, and I've always kind of presented this as, man, how would you like to be Peter and have Jesus turn around and call you Satan? I, this morning in my quiet time, I felt like God was going, I wasn't really saying that to Peter. I was literally talking to Satan because Jesus had told Peter that Satan had asked to sift him. And you, you've, uh, Fred, you've been going through Job, right? So you're looking at that kind of story that this actually goes on. 
So Peter was in the middle of that challenge, and Jesus cut it off, right? says, no, that is not going to happen. So he goes on in verse 24, which you can put that up in the next slide. Here's what, here's what he said. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Now look at those highlighted words. There's three things in here when we think about the cost of taking up the work that God has for us to become great in his kingdom. The first is we've got to deny ourselves. Um, and every man of war, I love that in the marriage chapters, we talk about Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We've got to put this pride aside. We've got to see others as greater than ourselves, this idea of servant leadership. We've got to be willing to set ourselves aside and love others, right? right? The second commandment. He tells us we've got to take up our cross. There's, there's work to do. You know, we're back to Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. He says, my, he, there is a burden. He says it's easy and light, but there's still a burden. We're to be yoked. We're to, we're to work. So are we willing to take up a cross? Another verse says, take up your cross daily. This is, this is not something you do once. This is not the decision when you first come forward. That's the first step. We've got to have it. But this is a daily decision to pay the cost to live in response to what Jesus did for us. And the last one is follow me. Um, you can't follow somebody and stay where you are. Uh, there's great pictures when you think about what Jesus called the disciples. And this is a great learning moment for me. There's stories in Matthew, Mark, and Luke about Jesus calling the disciples, and he goes to the shore, and in Matthew and Mark, he calls the disciples to follow him, and it says they left their nets, I think one of them says they left their father and the workers, and they went and followed Jesus. My mentor has convinced me that the Luke story is a different story, it's a different time, that Jesus went and traveled around, those guys went back to work, they followed him for a while, they went back to work, but in Luke, when he comes and asks them, this, now he's circled around, he's preached in all the cities, he shows up there, he asks to borrow the boat, right? He stands in the boat and preaches, and then he takes these guys that have been fishing all night, they've gone back to work, and they get that huge catch of fish in. You think Jesus might have been going, hey guys, you've been worried about your work, I think I got this. I can handle this fishing stuff. And he calls them to follow him, and what does the Luke passage say? What did they leave? Everything. Everything. Before they left the nets, the second time around, Jesus takes, he deals with them on the places where they're fearful, and they leave everything. Are we willing to pay the cost to do that? I lost my easy reading. So guys, no one taught us how to make disciples. It's a war, and it's going to cost us something. Now, that all feels a little heavy. Hey, there are some, I, at the very beginning, I talked about keep a hold of that fact that it said there was a reward there's a reward go to the next slide there are several passages passages in scripture we're promised reward now this isn't to earn our salvation that's free jesus did every bit of that for us to, to to get into his family to be fully righteous to be a child of god is a 100 percent free gift that he paid us paid for us it's done but how are we going to live our lives out in response to what he did this is the question because he gets us he made us he understands us we like rewards we like to earn things we, we like to there's something about god made in us to go work for some that's why he's got work for us to do but he promises us reward it says uh, for the son of man is going to come in his father's glory with his angels and then he will reward each person according to what he has done next slide second corinthians that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Kind of goes back to our first Corinthians when it talks about being tested by fire, right? What's going to last and what's not going to last. Uh, next one, Revelation twenty two twelve. My reward is with me. It's in Jesus' pocket, man. He's got it with him when he comes. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. So we've seen this work and this reward thing from the very beginning of Scripture to the very end. God has work for you to do. And he's called you to be great in his kingdom. So we want to overcome these, uh, these three things that hold us back. Um, and go on to the Matthew 9, 35 to 38. 
And one of y'all, one of y'all actually already quoted the scripture a little bit this morning. This is Jesus after he's uh, you know, met the woman at the well and he's preached to all the, the Samaritans and he sees all these people out there. And it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his fields. We did a quiet time on this yesterday, and, and I got struck in my quiet time after having looked at this verse so many times. And the first time yesterday, I realized in verse 38, my primary job is to ask. It's to pray. Until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. God's the one who does the sending. God's the one who changes people's hearts. He allows us to be a part of training them up and sending them out. The harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. Ezekiel gives us a, a pretty uh, stark picture um, that says, I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it, but I found none. Do you ever feel that way some days in, in our world? Wondering what's coming? But let me tell you what, every one of you individually is the answer to that scripture. You personally, if you accept God's call that he's got work for you to do, that you're called to be great in the kingdom of God and you step in, that scripture cannot be true for you. There cannot be none because you're going to step in. So guys, here's the, here's the question. What's holding you back? If something's holding you back, what is it? What do you need to let go of? What do you need to lean into in the promises that God has given you? If you need to learn how to, how to build your relationship with God, get into an Every Man of Warrior group. Get into a cultivating holy beauty group. Begin to build those skills so you can get closer to God. I think the first three years I was in Every Man of Warrior was primarily about knocking down all the religious walls that I had. It may take you a little time. It's not a switch that gets flipped. This is an investment of time because we love God. I want to do uh, Isaiah 43 4. Skip a couple slides and go to that one. This is my last slide. Isaiah 43 4. I love this scripture. It says, Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. What a beautiful picture of what disciple making can mean in your life. If you'll take God's call to be great in his kingdom, he's called you to be great, and you'll take the work he's given you to do of the Great Commission, and you'll go share what he's commanded you and be willing to share that with somebody else and help them to know Jesus. He's going to give people in exchange for your life. Look at Bernie and those pictures I showed up there. Ah, the joy I get to see in that guy's life when he gets to see that God blessed the fact that he hung in there and kept discipling knuckleheads like me and that there's reward for you in that. Guys, thank you for letting me talk. I don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if that's normal time or long time. I feel like I've been talking for days. <laughs> but I love, I love this stuff. Yeah. Still got two hours. I got two hours left. <laughs> Thank y'all very much. I love you. <laughs> hey, I just want to uh, just say a couple things real quick. First of all, uh, Tom, I'm sorry. Called him Joe earlier. <laughs> got back to my Three seat, letters, and I felt like the Lord just punched me in the side of my head, and He said, "Hey, Jarhead, his name's Tom," and I said, "Aye, aye, sir." So we're good. I, I, just a couple of things, real quick. Uh, one, I, I, I love you guys so much. Thank you so much Thanks. for coming out. Uh, you know, when we went to the mountain, and uh, actually, uh, I think it was Richard and I were talking, and he was, we were like, "What? There's no conference this year? What? You know?" So uh, I'm glad you you. Uh, make it a point to come out here to uh, us and visit us here at Bethesda and uh, it was just a great great training uh, yesterday um, and then I just want to say this to you guys real quick uh, listen uh, when I when I was in the Marine Corps I had a best friend of mine and you know people used to tell me all the time you, you talk that way to your guys you guys cried together absolutely and not ever a single one of those guys were believers but we embraced each other because we loved one another we loved one another and I remember uh, my buddy Jared uh, he would, he would look at me sometimes, and he would tell me some of the hardest things known to man. And uh, I would say something to him like, he said, Freddie, I'm going to send you to this school because I want you to train, and I want you to get good at it, and I want you to come back, and I want you to train the rest of them. And I'd look at him, and I'd say, Jared, that's stupid, man. I don't want to do that. I'm a master sergeant. I, I should be doing other things. And he said, uh, no, 
you're, gonna, you're called to do this, and I want you to do this. You know, and then he'd look at me, and I'd, I'd put my head down, and I'd kind of mumble a little bit, because he did outrank <laughs> me, but I was able to mumble with him, because we knew each other for years. And he looked at me, and he said, Fred, it's a small, small price to pay to be the world's finest. Hmm. And as soon as he said that to me, I perked up, because I knew that there was training that needed to happen, and there was people that needed to do it. Listen to me when I say this to you right now. There will always be a reason why you cannot train. There will always be a reason why you can't enter a study. And the enemy will sit back and, and, and tell you that, hey, that paperwork uh, for the school of ministry is too hard to fill out. So, so <laughs> throw that to the side. Hey, that, that two-sentence uh, paragraph that you could do 12 font, double-spaced, and you know, make it three sentences, uh, that's, that's too much for you. So just go ahead and quit. Hey, that every man a warrior study, listen, you've been in the Church of God of Prophecy for 80 years. You don't need that training. You don't need to listen to that. You don't need to use those building blocks. Listen, I agree with you 100%, Chris, Tom, and the, the other two gentlemen here. That is a lie of the enemy. Yeah. That is a lie of the enemy. If you ever think that you have arrived, then I'll meet you right here. Hmm. Yeah. Because the only time that I know that we have arrived is when, one, we fly out of here, yeah. or two, the, the Lord says, son, you're done. I'm waiting on you. Come home. That's, right. yeah. That's the only two times that I'm going to be finished, right? And, and will my foundation crack? You're absolutely right. Will I fail? Yes, I will. Will I make mistakes? Absolutely. But I know that my God's bigger than that, and I know he's waiting for me because just like I said this morning, if my earthly father is pacing that floor at 5 a.m., waiting for his son to return, waiting for his mm. son to come home, then I know there's a God in heaven up there that's doing the exact same thing this morning. He's ready for you. And if you're called to be great, yeah. then don't sit in that chair. Don't sit back there and let your spiritual pride get the best of you. Right. Yeah. You stand up and you come forward and you take, you take hold of that. Uh, after this service right here, uh, if you feel like you want to sit in an Every Man a Warrior group and you want to you wanna where iron sharpens iron, you want to be held accountable, you want to you venture out and grow, uh, then there's all kinds of men in this church that's going to point you in the right direction. If you're a woman sitting in those pews and you're thinking, hey, I, I want to get with a group, I want to get in there and I want to get this ho cultivating holy beauties thing, then you go see Patty. Uh, Patty, raise your hand and smile. <laughs> you go see Patty and you, and you go see uh, our, our women's pastor, Denise. Raise your hand, Denise. Yeah, all right. And uh, you go see these people, and you get ready to get trained, right? You prepare yourself for training. Uh, sitting here is good. Going to first church is great. But there's nothing like kneecap to kneecap. Hmm. That's right. Because like I've said on so, uh, several occasions, I did not get saved here in this sanctuary. I got saved right back there with Pastor Jerry Westerfield, Look at me with his uh, nicest look he has. Look at him, the all nicest <laughs> looks, right? <laughs> kneecap to kneecap, and looking at me and asking me, uh, what do I believe? That's how I was saved. Hmm. I didn't need religion. I didn't need a set of rules. I needed to know that there was God who loved me and that he was pacing the floors and waiting for me to come home. So before we go, uh, do you have anything, Pastor Jerry? Right? He just said, shut up, son, and come home. All right? <laughs> that so, Atkinson uh, guy already talked a long time. So Let's before we go, we're just going to pray over the, uh, the Everyman of Warrior team because you're headed back to Chattanooga today? Uh, Nashville. Nashville, and you're headed back to, to Chattanooga. So they're headed back home to the great state of Tennessee, so we're just going to reach our hands forward. We're going to pray over their travels. All right, Father God, we just come before you right now, Lord Jesus, and we just pray over our brothers right now. Lord, we're so thankful for the ministry that they provide, Lord Jesus. We're thankful for the books that they have given us, and we're so thankful for the growth that has happened in this church. Lord, right now, as Tom and Chris uh, start that journey towards their homes, Lord Jesus, I just pray that your hand is upon them, Lord, and they are safe in their travel, and they reach their destination, Lord Jesus, and when they get there, they're just refreshed, they're ready, they're, uh, they're waking up tomorrow morning, and they're ready to take on the mission again, and that mission is to punch the devil in the face, Lord Jesus. And I just pray over these men right now, and I just uh, ask all these things through your son's holy name. Amen. Hey, we love you guys. Have a great day.